Um, let me introduce our fourth speaker for uh, this uh, um, seminar series. We are very happy to have with us B.J. Bustein. So um, B.J. Epstein is a senior lecturer in literature and translation, actually is associate professor now, <laughs> literature and translation in School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at University of East Anglia. She has published monographs on how LGBTQ characters are represented in English language children's literature and books for young adults and on the translation of figurative language in children's literature. She has edited two books on translation to and between the Nordic languages and co-edited a book on queer approaches to translation. She is currently researching how the maternal figure is depicted in literature with a focus on the portrayal of breastfeeding in children's literature. Besides BJ's academic publications, she regularly writes for popular magazines and literature and newspapers. This includes personal essays, book reviews, and research-inspired articles. BJ is also a writer, editor, and translator from the Scandinavian languages to English. She appears regularly in the media. In her free time, BJ volunteers as a breastfeeding counselor on the National Breastfeeding Helpline and as a peer supporter for pregnancy sickness support. She is also a trained doula and an IBCLC. So uh, thank you again, uh, BJ, for being with us. Uh, Federica, do you want to add anything about uh, the, the talk? Um, not really. I'm, I'm, I just wanted to remind you all that it will be recorded and it will be available for everyone on the website of the Institute. So it will be turned into a podcast and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have the chance to also launch that um, the kind of um, digital media uh, series. So I really look forward to your talk. Thanks again for joining us. Perfect, DJ. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for inviting me and thank you to everybody who has chosen to come along this evening. Um, so I'm doing it kind of the old fashioned way, uh, no screen sharing, just me chatting. And um, I hope that you will have plenty of comments and questions after I'm done chatting. Um, and yes, please feel free to write them in the text box or wait and then you can ask them kind of orally in a little while. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, the background of the project and kind of then I'll go into a bit more detail about my findings and as noted then we'll have time for some discussion and questions. So what I'm talking about today is um, masturbation and queer females in young adult literature and you may wonder why I came, why I came to what seems like a slightly niche topic. Um, well so as um, Olga said when she was introducing me I've been researching LGBTQ plus literature for quite a long time especially LGBTQ plus literature for younger readers. Um, I think probably I started analyzing it as a scholar about 16 years ago. <laughs> so, so I've been in the field for a while. Um, and personally, I'm very interested in a comparative perspective. So in my case, um, you know, I work on the Scandinavian languages. So I'm interested in what does Scandinavian literature do? What does English language literature do? Or I'm interested in how are straight characters depicted, how are queer characters depicted, and so on. And I hope that some of you from your own kind of reading and scholarly analysis will have other useful comparisons that you could add in. So in 2012, so 10 years ago now, I published a monograph analyzing LGBTQ plus literature for children and young adults very generally. And I looked, it was kind of the, it was really the first kind of scholarly study of this topic. And I had a huge corpus of texts and I looked at lots of different topics because I was trying to kind of do a sort of um, slightly superficial overview of the whole field rather than go into depth on any one topic. So, for example, I looked at the typical plots of picture books with queer characters or how marriage was depicted or the fact that there was a lack of intersectionality or lack of diversity and so on. You know, so I had lots of different things that I was looking at. One of the findings from that book was that queer females, so lesbian, bisexual, otherwise queer, however you want to sort of define that, queer females didn't seem to have much of 
in the way of sex lives in young adult literature. I found lots of sex in books featuring queer males, so gay males, bisexual males, and so on, but the queer females, there really wasn't a whole lot going on. And just to pause to note that 10 years ago, you didn't see a lot of non-binary or genderqueer or even trans characters in sexual scenes, um, or even generally in these books. So that's why I'm talking specifically about queer males and queer females. Um, that has changed in more recent times, but I'm just telling you about my findings from 10 years ago. So I was thinking, well, this is a bit strange. What's going on with these queer females? Why do they not have any sex lives? So after I published that book, I decided to look at sex more specifically in young adult literature. And I published an article about that some years after that book. I can't, you know, maybe a year or two after the book. And in there, I compared queer males to queer females, and I looked at their sexual interactions, so sex between people. But one thing that I didn't include in that article was masturbation, even though I found that there were a lot of queer males masturbating in young adult literature. So again, this was, you know, getting me thinking that I needed to do something more in that. So my questions when I started off on this particular research project were things like, who experiences pleasure in young adult literature? Who deserves to, you know, who is society saying deserves to have pleasure? And how does this reflect or even reinforce societal views about sexuality? And then, you know, why does that matter? You know, you could sit there and say, well, that's a silly topic for you, for your research, but that's what academics do. But actually, I felt that this had a larger meaning um, for kind of society and for the readers of these books. So that's where I decided to, um, that's why I decided to just start this research project. And that was my starting point. So this is a slight spoiler here for what I'm going to say, but you may not be surprised to learn that my findings from this research project suggest that there's a real societal discomfort with masturbation with female sexuality and with lesbian sexuality in particular. And that kind of combination makes queer female solo sex invisible and possibly taboo in English language young adult literature. To me, this lack, this missing um, topic then reinforces societal ideas about female sexuality and especially queer female sexuality. So I would suggest that there's something of a negative feedback loop. So that's kind of an overview of the project and kind of what my findings were. And so now I'd like to go through it a little bit to kind of give you the evidence. And first I want to start with some scholarly background about masturbation, because there has been research into masturbation as both a cultural concept and as a literary concept. So if you look at scholarly literature on masturbation, you'll find that it has generally been considered anti-Christian. And for many people, anti-Christian is the same as saying anti-Western society. Those things are not equivalent. It's just how many people seem to view it. And masturbation is also frequently considered dangerous and threatening. So that's how it's been depicted over the ages. Thomas Lacour, who is one of the biggest writers on masturbation, which is a slightly strange phrase, um, says that there are three things that make masturbation uh, um, considered unnatural um, in society. So he's talking about society, he's not talking specifically about literature. Um, the three things are that masturbation is not with another person, it, usually. So it's generally something that's private, and not social and people are concerned about things that are not social concerned about things that are inward facing not outward facing another issue is that it is considered less real because it's motivated by your imagination or by pictures or by videos stories um, so rather than a real person in front of you and finally Many people consider it to be addictive or primal or transgressive 
because it's one person alone controlling it. It's not something that can be controlled by another person. It doesn't involve another person. It's, it can't easily be controlled by parents or, you know, by the church or whatever. And that's transgress transgressive. That's scary. So masturbation has traditionally been seen as a challenge to society and specifically to ideas about what sex is for. When sex is considered to be something that's aimed at procreation, um, that makes people wonder about masturbation because masturbation has nothing to do with procreation. It's about recreation, it's about pleasure. So if you go a little bit further into this research and then you specifically look at young people, you would notice, and I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, that masturbation is about um, is seen as something bad and it's seen as something that parents, guardians, teachers, churches, and so on need to ensure that young people don't do. That's hard to do because, you know, if you want to control, say, your daughter's sex life, perhaps you could keep her in the house, not let her out with her boyfriend or girlfriend, um, or, you know, not allow them to be alone together. You know, that's controlling a sex life. But it's a lot harder to control somebody's private sex life, their solitary sex life. So there's a lot of research about how you need to control children and young adults. Um, Jean Stengers and Anne Van Neck, who've also written about masturbation, say that masturbation is considered medically dangerous for children. People thought that if children, and some still think that if children or young adults do it, you know, they could go blind or they could get weakened or that, you know, their mental facilities wouldn't work very well. So parents and the church, because again, we're mostly talking about the church and Christianity, feel that prevention is required. And over the years, over the centuries, there have been lots of suggestions for, for, for prevention. You know, wear your child out with sports or other kinds of vigorous activity. Distract them, send them swimming, control their diet. You know, don't give them anything spicy because spicy food was thought to kind of invigorate them and make them think naughty thoughts. Um, and as I'm sure you know, there were even inventions and tools. So you would put something you know, a chastity belt or a little cage over a child or young person's genitals to control them. You know, many of these tools look like real torture devices. Along with this, there was a lot of language used to describe masturbation, things like it's a bad habit, it's a vice, it's a sin, it's something that needs to be cured. And parents would use these words, use these tools, use these activities and then also threaten children like we will cut off your hands we will cut off your penis you know that kind of language um, so that they could really control um, solitary sex and there were extreme cases noted where parents actually resorted to surgical interventions or to medication to try to control what they thought of as kind of extreme sexuality now a lot of this it has to be said is mostly in regard to male masturbation and that's connected to these ideas about how, you know, men are there with their seed and you do not want to spill the seed or waste the seed. And there are a lot of these devices that are for men in particular. So I found it really interesting that there's a lot of concern about procreation. But that means that there was a lot of research or a lot of discussion about males and there's less about females. And partly it's because of this lack of concerns about spilling the seed. But partly it's also because females were thought to be less sexual. People believed, and many still believe, that females don't do this kind of thing. They're not interested in sex. Um, you know, women are just there passive. You know, they're just there to absorb the man's seed and to allow men to take their pleasure. So you find that a lot in the research. Now, views on masturbation began to change kind of around the time of Freud, and there's a whole lot we could thank or blame Freud for. And one is kind of the views of masturbation because he started to suggest that it was acceptable for young people. So that's positive. But on the other hand, he said that it was a necessary practice stage. So it's something you do need to do, but only for a short period of time. And if you do it too often, if that stage goes on too long, or you don't do it correctly, that's when Freud and his followers thought it was a problem. Um, now, in more recent times than Freud, many people still have that point of view. However, there are others who say um, 
well, menstruation is useful because it's a way to prevent unwanted pregnancy and it's a way to prevent getting sexually transmitted diseases, you know? Um, and yet many people are still very uncomfortable with young people masturbating. Um, there was an interesting example because in the United States, um, the then US Surgeon General, so she was the highest doctor in the United States, Joycelyn Elders, and she was asked um, at a conference on medicine whether it was a good idea to teach children about masturbation. And she said, I quote, I think that it is something that's part of human sexuality and it's part of something that perhaps should be taught, but we've not even taught our children the very basics. So she's saying, perhaps, yeah, it's basic sexuality. However, we haven't really taught our children the basics. Based on what she just said, that quote, she was forced to resign her job. So for even suggesting that masturbation was natural and could be part of sex education, and indeed, as we know, could prevent pregnancies and STDs, she lost her job as the kind of head doctor of the United States. But despite all this, all the research shows that masturbation is nearly always young people's first sexual experiences. So it's kind of a universal experience, and yet we're really frightened of talking about it. Okay, so to talk a little bit more about kind of male versus female um, sexuality, one is that Masturbation tends to be linked to hypersexuality. So it's thought, oh, you know, men, they're so sexual. So they'll need to masturbate because they just have all these sexual feelings that they need to get out and they can't have enough sex. So they need to masturbate as well. But that's not the same for females. For females, it's thought, well, first of all, you wouldn't really do that. But if a female does do that, then it's somehow excessive or it's even degenerate. It's not really acceptable for a female. And along those lines, I discovered that in research on queer masturbation, gay men's masturbation is often described in really celebratory terms like, wow, look, they're taking back their sexuality and you know, they can do it together. It's a healthy part of your sex life. Do it on your own. Do it with your boyfriend or a partner. Do it in groups, you know, and that's understandable because if men are thought to be sexual, gay males are perceived by our society as hypersexual. However, I found very little on queer female masturbation. It's like there's just this kind of emptiness in the research. So um, what I, just to finish up the kind of background, I'd say there was very little on females, but when I did find something, the views were, just to reiterate, women and girls don't do it. They're not very sexual. Or if they do do it, it either has to be an early stage in their sexuality or they are immature to do it because Freud gave people the idea that clitoral stimulation was the incorrect way for a woman, for a woman to, um, to experience pleasure. He said women need to be penetrated. And so if a woman is, is touching her clitoris, that's immature. And so we still have those ideas in our society. You either don't do it or you're doing it the wrong way. <laughs> So after I kind of did this research um, and learned about the background of masturbation in our society here in the West, just to acknowledge that it's very much kind of the Western perspective, I began to look at young adult fiction. And obviously I had some from my earlier research, but I also needed to update it. And again, you know, as I said, it's not surprising. Both queer and heterosexual males are shown as very sexual in young adult books and females are not. And this includes masturbation. So in terms of queer males, the descriptions are really blunt, really accepting. They use phrases, and these are quotes, you know, such as, you know, I'm jerking off, I'm having a mono hand maneuver, I'm pulling, you know, so they use that sort of language. Um, they also talk in a rather frank way about the porn that they like to watch or the thoughts that they have while they're masturbating. The young men are depicted as knowing what they like to do. They're described openly as doing it um, and they come to orgasm while they masturbate and that's also described. And then they clean it up afterwards with tissues. I found lots and lots of references to tissues in young adult literature. So just as one example, and I mean, really, I could have chosen lots of possible examples here. Um, 
There's a book called Hero by Perry Moore, and the main character is called Tom. And Tom has a scene where he's discussing his rules for masturbating. And one of his rules is there couldn't be anyone else in the house when I did it. The last thing I needed was to get caught jerking off to an oiled muscle stud. Although Tom doesn't want to get caught, which is understandable, doesn't want to be seen masturbating as most people don't, he's not actually ashamed about it, nor should he be. He's very clear about what he likes. He likes an oiled muscle stud. He accepts his preferences. He knows when to do it when other people are away. And then he cleans up afterwards. And there are lots of other examples of male characters um, talking about what they like to think of, what they watch, and how they clean up. You know, Robin Reardon, whose works are rather problematic, but that's a slightly different matter. You know, she has characters sitting there to, thinking about um, their boyfriends while they're masturbating, for example. So the young men in these novels and in and other LGBTQ young adult novels in my corpus and other ones that I've read since have really active sex lives, not just masturbation, but sex lives with other young men. And it's not like it's an either or situation. So you have descriptions in the same book of a man, a young man having sex with his boyfriend. But then a few pages later, he comes home and he's thinking about the sex that he had with his boyfriend and he masturbates. So it's just depicted almost as a normal part of his life, a healthy aspect of his sex life. So masturbation for these queer males is not about a stage, the way Freud suggested, but it's part of a lively and varied sex life. It's not an embarrassment. It's not a replacement for sex with a partner. It's just one of many things on the menu, as it were. Now, they may not want their parents to find them. They may talk about how they hide their porn or how they clear the, um, the browser on their computer, but they never say they shouldn't do it. The only kind of um, uh, example of something to the contrary here is in some of the books where the parents are religious. And there are a couple of examples <clears throat> excuse me, where parents um, talk about sending their child for conversion or to therapy or to a church group with the aim of trying to make them straight. And that's kind of about them generally as gay young men or bisexual gay men. It's never specifically about the masturbation. And I think that's an important distinction. You know, you don't have any young men who are going, oh, I'm really, you know, embarrassed about my masturbation or you know, my parents say I need to go to therapy for masturbation, nothing like that. It's just there might be other issues going on with their parents. Now, the situation is very different for young females in young adult literature. Now, as I said, I had a really big corpus of texts, you know, dozens and dozens of texts that I've read over the years. And I found a few by few, I actually mean a very few um, examples of sex between two young women. Um, and just to say, on those in those scenes, they often are what I call the fade to black scenes. So you might say, sorry, you might see two young women talking to each other and maybe holding hands, and they might lean in for a kiss, and then the scene cuts. So when I say that you see sex scenes, often they are not detailed at all. Often they are um, very basic in their description. And it's kind of like, oh, you know, she was so beautiful. I wanted to touch her. The next day, you know, so it just switches very quickly. And that's not what happens in books with young men. So that's what we see for sex between two young women. And then I found almost no descriptions of gay, teen or bisexual teenage females masturbating. The only real example that I found, again, over dozens of books, is one that you might not even be masturbation at all. It's a book called Gravity by a Canadian author called Liam Lieberman. And in it, there's a scene where the main character, who's called Ellie, puts a pillow between her legs. And then that's it. There's no description of what she's doing with that pillow, you know, like, oh, she's humping the pillow or rubbing it against her, nothing like that. It's just she puts the pillow there. 
So depending on your own experience, your own background, how carefully you read and parse what's going on there, you could quite um, easily misinterpret that scene. You know, well, you know, maybe her legs are uncomfortable in bed, or maybe her back is, or maybe she just likes to sleep like that, or maybe she enjoys the feel of the pillow. You know, there are all sorts of possible interpretations. I think um, an educated or experienced reader would be needed in order to think, hmm, at least thinking about her uh, about a girl that she likes, could she be masturbating? I don't know. And that was kind of the main possible scene that I found across all these books, which I find kind of shocking. Um, I did not find queer females talking either to the reader or to each other about their sexual thoughts. You know, they weren't saying, oh, you know, I thought about that beautiful girl I saw across the lunchroom um, and I, and I, you know, reached my fingers down. Nothing like that. They never talk about their favorite porn. If you remember Tom talking about his oiled muscle stud, we don't get any of that for females. Um, we don't hear any discussion of toys. I couldn't find any vibrators, no lube, and so on. It's just this blank. Now, some of you may be thinking, now, wasn't there a book called Sugar Rush? Um, and Sugar Rush, indeed, is a young adult novel that features a queer main character, and it was turned into a TV series. If you've seen the TV series, the very first scene of the TV series shows the main character using an electric toothbrush as a vibrator. But that's the TV series. That is not in the book. So sometimes when people say, yes, but I, I know Sugar Rush includes masturbation. No, it doesn't. Um, and then there are a couple others that sometimes people mention as examples, like Caitlin Moran's um, How to Build a Girl. But that is that a young adult novel? You know, that's kind of debatable as well. And also it's more of a sort of memoir based on her life. So it is slightly different. But in general, I would say that there's this real blank when it comes to queer females in, um, yeah, in young adult literature. And, you know, as I told you before, we have this fade to black when it comes to two or more girls together. It's, it's again, this total black, this darkness, this blank when it comes to um, masturbation. And I think that really shows that our society is very uncomfortable with female sexuality. Now, this lack leads me to a number of questions. Do people believe that teenage girls don't masturbate? Do people believe that lesbians or bisexual females in particular don't masturbate? Do readers not want to read about it? Or at the very least, do publishers think that readers don't want to read about it or should not read about it? All important things to consider. Now, masturbation is considered by some people to be an important part of women's liberation. Thomas Lecour, who I mentioned before, says that masturbation was embraced first by the women's movement and then by various parts of the male gay movement as a practice in the service of freedom, autonomy, and rebellion against the status quo. Sex with oneself came to stand for autonomy, even autarky. Autarky means independence. Um, it was not reprehensible or frightening, but liberating, benign, and attractive. Now, there you, you're talking about the women's movement, and some of you may be familiar that, you know, some kind of second wave feminists were saying, look, everybody get a mirror, women, look at your genitals, touch your genitals, get comfortable with your body, tell people what you want. You know, so there was a lot of that going on, but that does not seem to have trickled down. That's a bad phrase to use. Um, in the context, but it doesn't seem to have come down to young adult literature. So why are publishers so reticent about females? You know, um, you would think that contemporary texts would be comfortable with kind of young women liberating themselves from compulsory heterosexuality, to borrow Adrian Rich's term, and would thus include masturbation, perhaps as a way of breaking away from shame the shame that girls and women have traditionally been taught to feel about our bodies and our sexuality. Um, but Philippe Breno, who's another researcher on masturbation, says that female masturbatory love, whether solitary or sapphic, has found its literary expression with more difficulty than the male version because of this reticence on the part of publishers. So he acknowledges that you see it in literature with men, but not with females. Let's come back to that in just one minute um, to think about why publishers are so reticent. Before I do, I just wanted to give a little comparison. I told you I like the comparative perspective and I wanted to know how do straight 
young adults have their sex lives depicted in um, in young adult literature. So just for the sake of what I'm saying today, and in the interest of keeping this relatively short, so we have time for discussion, I'm just going to talk about Melvin Burgess. And I'm sure some of you know Melvin Burgess's work. He writes a lot of young adult novels, um, you know, hard hitting. He, he includes drugs, he includes sex, very honest um, in, in the way that he writes about things for young adults. So. I would say, though, that one of the issues for me is that his books only feature straight characters, but then maybe that's what he knows. So one of his books is called Doing It. I bet you can guess that it has a lot to do with sex and the three it's three main male characters who are just fascinated by sex. They masturbate very, very frequently in this book and they talk about it. They talk about they call their penises um, Mr. Nobby as though he's a sort of separate person, a separate character, and they'll talk about Mr. Nobby needs a workout, or I'm going to give Mr. Nobby a hand, I'm going to hang out with Mr. Nobby. Again, no shame about it, it's just something we talk about all the time. And they have lots of sex, including the solo sex. So that's, you know, male characters. But um, female characters and Melvin Burgess are not talked about in the same way, they don't name their genitals. <laughs> They don't talk about masturbation or sex without compunction. At most, one character is described with a euphemism as having a diddle. That's how female masturbation is described. Now, these are just some examples by the same author, but I would say they're pretty typical of the male-female divide that we see in young adult literature and generally in society. Um, now, I'm not gonna go into any bigger examples really with kind of straight lit or with um yeah this division but i just wanted to say one other thing that i thought was interesting about it um the book that features the female character having a diddle, diddle is called the lady and lady on the cover has a parental advisory regarding explicit content doing it with all that sex and mr nobby having a workout does not have a parental advisory both of those books are about sexual feelings and experiences. One features males and one features a female. And I looked at um, copies of these books in the library and I, I'm in Norwich and Norwich actually, our main library, you might be surprised to know, is the busiest library in the UK in terms of how many people visit it and how many people take out um, copies. And Lady, so the book with a female character, has a library stamp inside it that says this book is recommended for older teenagers. So it's almost a bit of censoring there, but doing it has no such stamp. Both books feature sex scenes, um, although, of course, as I already noted, doing it has a lot more, including a lot more masturbation. And yet the one with the female character is considered explicit and only for older teenagers. Now, that's just a side point that I felt that I wanted to tell you because I thought that was really interesting. So, yes, that straight corpus that I'm telling you about is very small and only features Melvin Burgess's work just as a way of limiting it. Um, but as he wrote a lot about sex, I still thought it was very instructive. So the question that I'd like us to start kind of um, analyzing here as we draw towards a close is where is female masturbation, especially for queer females in literature? So being told by society or by your parents or you know by the kind of beliefs that Freud has kind of inculcated um, in our in our worldview these days it, and then being told this and then believing it that autoeroticism is infantile and it's not appropriate may make girls and women less likely to talk about it if they do do it it may even make them less likely to do it. And then furthermore, if society does believe that this is a correct understanding of women's sexuality, then authors and publishers, I think, would be reluctant to feature masturbation in young adult literature. Because if you think it's not something for girls and women, you might be frightened of encouraging young females to masturbate if you include it in literature. You know, because so many literature is powerful, but many people have this idea that, oh, if a child reads something in a book, they're going to want to be that thing. Like, we can't have gay penguins because my child might want to grow up to be gay. 
or a penguin. Nobody seems worried about that bit. Um, but I think that there is a fear that if you feature it in literature, it might encourage young women to be infantile or to have the wrong sort of sexuality, this kind of inward looking transgressive sexuality, clitoral sexuality rather than penetrative sexuality. Related to this is, I think, this concept that females are not sexual and should be prudish, should be polite, should be wait, should wait to be penetrated. Sex for females should be procreative, not recreative, you know. Um, you know, so if you have all those ideas, it's understandable that you're going to think, well, why would I write about that? Or why would I want to see that published? Or who would buy that book? Furthermore, we have this idea in our society that queer women in particular aren't sexual. You know, we talked about how gay men are seen as kind of hypersexual, but if queer women are seen as, well, they're extra female, so they're not very sexual because females shouldn't be sexual, two women together or a woman alone would be seen as, yeah, not, not sexual at all. Um, that's the wrong kind of sexuality. I'm sure you've heard of the concept of lesbian bed death. And so people believe that two women together aren't going to want to be sexual, that their sexuality is just going to die out quite quickly, quite quickly. So a queer girl in literature would not be seen as a sexual creature and certainly not as sexual or even as hypersexual as a queer male is. And I already mentioned this kind of erroneous idea that women don't masturbate or masturbate incorrectly because of their anatomy. And, you know, Freud saying that it's more mature to use the vagina for penetration rather than to enjoy um, clitoral stimulation. So research shows and society generally seems to believe that women are not aware of our bodies or that we use our bodies incorrectly or that hormone, our hormones or our thoughts don't lead us to think in sexual ways. You know, people don't even have knowledge about things such as clitoral erections, which do happen. So the fact that there's so little knowledge about females and the belief that we females don't have that knowledge um, suggests that they'd be very uncomfortable with female sexuality. Interestingly, research shows that females who are in same sex relationships are actually much more sa um, sexually satisfied than females in opposite sex relationships. So that implies that women are actually very attuned to their female, to the female body, to their own bodies, to other female bodies. They know how to give pleasure. They know how to receive pleasure. So you'd think masturbation would be a really useful tool for learning how to find and give satisfaction. Now, if female masturbation only led to a healthy heterosexual life, you would perhaps expect to see it in young adult literature um, because a lot of YA novels do feature sex scenes especially when it comes to heterosexual characters. So you'd think that it would be masturbation might be featured there because it's educational. You could say it's one stage on the way to having a healthy heterosexual life. Um, but the lack of female masturbation, I think, just doesn't bear that out. I think the fact that you don't even see straight female masturbation shows that we're really uncomfortable with masturbation for females generally. Thomas LaCour says that masturbation is the act through which females, through which through which women signal our rejection of the normative sexual order. So if that's true, then you would expect maybe more masturbation and why novels that feature non-heterosexual young women, because those are the women who are going to be rejecting the normative sexual order. But no, we don't see that either. Um, masturbation generally is worryingly absent from young adult novels with female LGBTQ characters even though it's common, as I noted, in Y novels with straight males and queer males. In short, sum this up, YA books do not show female characters masturbating, whether they're straight female or queer female, although both queer and straight males regularly do so in literature. And I think this missing sexual action from literature both reflects and strengthens the Western and it must be said Christian idea in the West that A, females are not as sexual as males, and B, that masturbation is an inappropriate activity for females. In turn, I think this absence in literature might increase feelings of shame or confusion or wrongness um, that young women might feel 
if young women are indeed having their first orgasms and their first sexual experiences through masturbation, but they don't see it in society, they don't see it in books, they don't see it in other forms of media, how are they going to feel about their sexuality? They're going to think they're doing something wrong, disgusting, dirty. That's a bad message to be sending them. So this is definitely a problem for all young females, but I think that this is especially a problem for young queer females who already receive so many negative messages about their sexuality in our society. And to close, I'd like to say, I think we must allow and encourage all people, all young people to find pleasure in their own bodies, but especially I'd like to see a change to literature and where we could see queer young women finding pleasure in their own bodies. That's all I'm going to say for now, and then I'm happy to take questions and to hear your own thoughts about it. Thanks a lot, BJ, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. You. Federica and I have a couple of questions. Yeah, Let's see if uh, there is a first. Uh, yeah. Um, if anybody in our virtual public wants to jump in, we're more than happy to. And uh, let me remind you, you can also drop a question in the chat. We are going to read it if you don't feel like speaking directly. Um, while we while we wait for it, I was uh, I was your thought your your talk was incredibly fascinating and and engaging, and it made me really think about again representation, which I think it's one of the key theme in our in our series and all speakers have tackled it from a different perspective and it's absolutely wonderful um to see um one thing that crossed my mind um is yes this inability of the spoken word to function properly and yes of course we have between the per like between the public and the spoken word there is a whole machinery in in the middle because we have publishers we have we have um uh, markets that are not keen on uh, um circulating uh, the, the word no whilst the visual medium is more up for it yes and it made me think about your uh, in a very recent tv series called sex education <laughs> That's, i just see a question popped up in the chat on the oh, really yeah fantastic <laughs> because there you really see you have two dimensions on the one hand you you see the act in progress and you see there is there is um intergender and is also it like um uh like is 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 done by, by both women and men by sexual heterosexual and homosexual and non-binary so you have a whole spectrum of the all possibilities portrayed and powerfully portrayed and also the idea of the sex education brings in the pedagogical uh mm. dimension of all of it and the the, the psychiatry like the, the psychotherapist is there to function has um, like as a key to unlock this 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 unspoken discourse but really really it really strikes me how there is a gap between what can be shown and represented and what can be said because many times you have this this montage there are just montage of images you now of scenes and 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 you have music instead of words Mm, so that really made me think it's more of a suggestion than than a question but it's no no this really interesting really fascinating i mean i have to i have to say i mean maybe I, I this is me being a true literature person but i don't actually own a tv and <laughs> um and so i've not seen i've heard the, about the show but i've never seen it and um i think i just am so focused on books and you know i have two young children so i never would get a chance to watch mm -hmm. anything on tv anyway um but one of the things that i feel about is a difference between tv slash film and books is that reading books is kind of a solitary experience it is kind of like our masturbation in some ways you know something that you do alone you're usually thinking about it alone and so i wonder if people are a little bit more cautious about what they put in books because they're worried that that it's too much of a direct kind of connection exactly. with readers and films and TV. I think, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, you might be watching with your friends or perhaps with a parent or a guardian, which would be a little bit creepy, perhaps. In the, yeah, in but the perhaps irony in that sense, in that context, when it's socially experienced, it becomes like a, like a way of, of diffusing the tension that surrounds it. Uh, whilst by reading alone, you're faced with your own 
also censor sense of censorship mm. because there is this inward sense of shame no that affects many men, many men and many women mostly women i think uh from what you say so and, and girls so now here we're talking about girls and girlhood so we have to really center on this specific yes. moment in a woman's life um so yeah thank you very much Absolutely. yeah that's really interesting oh i see a very very long um question let's see Reason is a bad by Villette Leduc. Yes, I was thinking about that uh, earlier. I don't know that. I don't know that work. Let's see. Let's give me so, for reason, Isabel by Violette Leduc suffered a similar fate on censorship on female sexual relations of the two young women discovering their pleasure in an internet in the 1950s. And the final version today has surely been censored, even with Simone de Beauvoir's support for publication. It was not a YA literature, but the ideology resonates as dominant today. Any examples or hints in Scandinavian literature at all? Yeah. Oh, th thanks for letting me kind of go on about my comparative um, perspective. So thanks for asking that. And that's really interesting. I don't I don't know that work. Um, yes, I would say that it is different in Scandinavian literature. Um, many people have the idea. I myself used to have the idea that Scandinavian literature is always more liberal than English language literature. It's true about some topics such as death, um, for example, where there's a lot more frankness about it. Um, and it is true about certain aspects of sexuality, but not everything. I have, um, I would say that some of the same issues are in Scandinavian young adult literature. One of the, uh, that you, there is a, um, less frankness when it comes to talking about female sexuality. However, I have found examples in Scandinavian, specifically in Swedish young adult literature, of, for example, girls masturbating together. So I think of a scene um, in a book called Tiga where a bunch of girls are at a sort of party or somebody's house and they go into the bathroom and they each take turns lying in the bathtub and masturbating while, they, while the others kind of are watching and hanging out together. And I find that really interesting because I've not found any equivalent to that in English. So although I'm saying in general in Swedish, I do think that there's more reticence about female sexuality than male sexuality. It's still kind of that step beyond what we have in English at the moment. Yeah, maybe that needs to be my next project because even though I'm aware of these things, I haven't actually written it down as sort of a um, proper you know, research article yet. Thank you, BJ. While we're waiting for other questions to pop up in the chat, um, I have a, a couple of um, questions for you as well. So the first one is concerning uh, the uh, Sugar Rush uh, mm. uh, series that you mentioned and uh, the, the book it is uh, inspired by. Um, I was wondering how much time has passed between uh, the TV transposition of the book and if according to you, the difference in timing um, also allowed a more uh, open uh, um, uh, description of the masturbating act. Actually, yeah, uh, being more explicit with that. That's a really good question. I can't tell you the exact dates, but I would say that I think it harkens back to our discussion about sex education and the difference between book and film, because, you know, it's a way of drawing in readers. You know, the first scene is you hear this buzzing noise and then you see the girl, you know, in her bed and her, her um, electric toothbrush. And I think that is something about it being in the medium of television that allows for it rather than about um, kind of the challenge, like about, about the time passing and us feeling a little bit more accepting. I think it really is about the change to medium, partially bringing reader, not reader, sorry, viewers in and attracting readers. I'm partially just about you could do things differently in TV. And just to sort of note on Sugar Rush, um, this is this is slightly side point, but I find it really, really fascinating. So I feel I want to share it with you because I think you'd all be interested in this. That. So Sugar Rush was translated to Swedish and, you know, me with my comparative aspect, I'm really interested in how books get translated and what happens in translation. And in the book of Sugar Rush, the character who's called Sugar, but whose name is actually Maria, um, she repeatedly says in English how much she doesn't just want one boyfriend or one girlfriend. She wants to have lots of people. She's what we would call polyamorous, but she never uses that word about herself. She's always saying, you know, 
the way she puts it is, you know, if you have a favorite song, would you only ever play that one song? No, you want to listen to other songs too. So she feels you need to have kind of a variety of, of different songs, different types of music. Um, and there's a scene in the book where she's at a party and she has sex with, uh, I think it's four different boys, young men, one after the other at this party, and she's loving it. And she's described as being, you know, really happy from her facial expression. That's the English description. I looked at the Swedish translation, never expecting that I was going to see changes, but a lot of the polyamory was removed um, from it. And it was like, I was really surprised that they were so uncomfortable with it in Swedish. And I don't know whether it was the translator or the publisher, I suspect working as a translator myself, that it was the publisher telling the translator what needed to be changed. But in that scene in the party, she's not having sex with four boys. She has sex with one boy. And she doesn't go on and on about wanting lots of different partners. So to me, our society, even in a place that's considered more liberal, is very uncomfortable with female sexuality. Yeah. And thank you for the link. Yeah, Channel 4, which also, you know, was known for doing slightly more, um, yeah, transgressive work or a little bit more out there work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And while you were talking, uh, here we step away from the girlhood territory for a moment, but I thought it was... Uh, um, it would be interesting sharing with you um, something concerning sex and the city and uh, oh, the yes. post-feminism view on masturbation. I remember very well there is this episode with um, Charlotte, which is the um, probably most conservative, uh, at least sexually, of the four women. And uh, she gets this, uh, uh, this uh, vibrator for herself in a moment in which she is single and she start, starts um spending more time more and more time alone and uh, the friends start addressing her as addicted or mm -hmm. uh, um they, they use other words but uh, obsessed uh, for example so mm -hmm. definitely this activity uh, in a post feminist context is not portrayed positively and definitely mm -hmm. not in a way it is um, depicted today as a way closer to uh, the representation in the 70s in which maybe masturbation was more an act of uh, uh, emancipation uh, autonomy and uh, and uh, yeah freedom somehow yeah, absolutely so, no I, th I guess the sense that it's you know we were saying before about this why masturbation is viewed so poorly and it's people were afraid it would make you solitary would take you away from others and then exactly as you're saying you know we're thinking about the the 1970s and those women all kind of sitting in a circle together each with their own you know um mirror and being encouraged you know you think of somebody a sex activist like annie sprinkle or whatever really encouraging women to enjoy their bodies get to know their bodies um but even in a program that's about kind of sexual liberation like sex in the city supposedly is um although it's very heterosexual you know to be so negative about masturbation is really telling, I think. Yeah, it sounds very strange. And then there is a note by Karen Lindo. Do check out the graphic novel Vagi Vagin Tonic by Lily Son. It is French, but visually interesting for your work. And uh, I take advantage of this suggestion. And I, uh, sorry, let me drop my last uh, question. Yeah. Um, if you ever considered for your research to look into um, uh, why a magazines, uh, uh, young adult magazines for girls, uh, and specifically the, the, the part in which uh, they uh, answer to um, mails, emails, uh, letters from readers. Yes. Because I remember when I was a teenager, there were a lot of letters focused on masturbation. And uh, honestly, I can't remember their answers. I can't remember how they were um, advising teenager girls to behave on this regard. Mm -hmm. So probably this could be interesting for you. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. No, I hadn't actually thought about that. Um, but that's great. And also that makes me think that it would be useful to think about how sex education is taught in the schools. Um, you know, if I think about growing up in the United States and the sex ed that we received in schools, it was very focused on heterosexual sex. 
And it's all about how do you prevent a pregnancy? You know, here's how you put a condom on a banana. And, you know, here's how you don't want to get a disease. Nothing about, well, here's how you get pleasure. And here's how you enjoy yourself. And here's consent. You know, none of that was, was taught then. So I would love to see that actually in the magazines and to think more broadly about um, sex ed as a subject. Yeah, great idea. Thank you, Olga. Yeah, okay. Do we have any more questions from the from our audience? You can raise your virtual hand or you can drop it in the in the chat box. Anyway, our time is almost up. We said we were going to stay here for one hour and it's uh, uh, almost one hour in two minutes. So <laughs> yes, yeah. It's been really, really uh on spot mm -hmm. honestly thank you so much bj it was a great uh, great uh, uh, moment of uh, exchange and uh, the ideas started running and uh, yeah lots of great ideas from people in the chat and from the people asking questions so thank you very much for that thanks so much also noreen another great talk in this series thank you thank you thank you so uh, this is our fourth uh, uh, talk uh, and uh, um, next week uh, we are going to have another one on Thursday, same time. Um, Federica, do you want? And it's going to be the interview, isn't it? The interview with Julia Blasi. So, we, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I think it's a 10th, the interview. Oh, it's a 10th, sorry. Yeah, yes, I, yes. I miss anyway, that yeah, we invite you to keep uh, uh, an eye on the on the program, which at the moment I don't have. <laughs> um, there we go. Yes. Bear with me a second. So yeah. we moved the schedule quite a lot around. So yeah, yeah, nice. exactly. But we are yeah, so happy. Yeah, 27th of, uh, of October, yes. It's today. So we have the, the next one is the 10th, Olga. You're right. So the 10th of uh, November, we're going to have an interview with writer Julia Blasi. Okay. Writing uh, yeah. as so we... language generation trends. And just to remind you, Julia Blasi is the author of the essay Z Revolution, a book that aims to open dialogue and offer valuable insights into the traps and prejudices of generational ideas on identity, the use and use of social media, and imperative beauty and toxic relationships. So we really look forward to that. Yes, yes. So it's uh, not in one week, uh, in, in two weeks. In two weeks, yes. In two we, weeks. So we, we take have a, break. a We have a yeah, just, yeah. We take exactly. a break. So thank you so much for being with us, BJ. I am really looking forward to hearing more about your future uh, project and research. And uh, thank, thank you. you, everyone, for being with us again. Uh, it's it's great, really, to have this community around this topic. So yeah. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the questions and comments. You're welcome. Thanks again and have a lovely evening. Thank you too. Bye. 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 Goodbye.